Good morning, Shannon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm at South Virginia University for the graduation, and I want to congratulate graduates all across the country. Yes, and we are very grateful they worked together with you and your team so that we could have you with us this morning. Our thanks to the university. Uh, I want to start here by playing something the president had to say this morning about relations with China and the U.S. Well, uh, now number one, you're right. We should have an open hotline. At the Bali conference, that's what the president, Xi, and I agreed we were going to do and meet on. And then this silly balloon that was carrying two freight cars worth of its spine equipment was flying over the United States, and it got shot down, and uh, everything changed um, in terms of talking to one another. I think you're going to see that begin to thaw very shortly. So a lot to unpack there, but the president essentially said that things are going to be better communication wise with China. At the same time, he's coming off the G7 where the conversation and the message coming from that was supposed to be strength and unity against China. What do you make of what he said about where we stand this relationship with China? Well, we have demonstrated to China that the world community is standing up for the tradition of uh, the international order that was established after World War II. But in the context of uh, a nuclear power like China with uh, uh, conflicting goals, we have to have a line of communication. Uh, it's something that we maintain throughout the Cold War with the Soviet Union, even at the height of the Cold War, because uh, you do want to be able to communicate in times of crisis. So that's common common sense, and it actually serves a military purpose, too, to communicate uh, our intentions and to make sure that they don't misinterpret what we're doing and we don't misinterpret what they're doing. Yeah, it sounds like that is going to reconnect there very soon. So at the G7, this announcement that we are now going to engage in training of Ukrainian pilots on numbers of aircraft, including F-16s, and that those jets may eventually flow into the country from numerous sources, potentially. Um, the Wall Street Journal editorial board says this, at last, F-16s for Ukraine. That's been the White House pattern throughout the Ukraine conflict. Resist more advanced weapons, then finally provide them much later after more carnage. I mean, people think about the, the Abrams tanks and other issues that eventually were provided to Ukraine after some delay. What do you make of this criticism in many different quarters that when it comes to how we've equipped Ukraine, sometimes it's been too little too late? Well, uh, first of all, you have to recognize that uh, the administration, and President Biden in particular, put together a coalition of NATO and most of the world to stand against an unauthorized, unprovoked, brutal attack by the Russians. I don't think anyone expected that kind of uh, action diplomatically and economically imposing sanctions. And then we began to give uh, the Ukrainians what they needed. Uh, in the first stage of the war, they needed uh, anti-tank weapons, uh, javelins. We provided those. They needed air defense systems. We gave them uh, Stinger missiles. Now, as they're organizing to conduct a counteroffensive, we've provided them not only the equipment, the tanks, but we've also acquired them the training so they can operate as a coordinated combined arms team. Uh, and now, the other issue here, which has been constant, has been air defense. And we've given them air defense systems like the Patriot missile system. So we're now at the point where their aircraft have been essentially worn out in many respects, and we're going to replace them eventually with F-16s, probably from our NATO allies but the pilots can be trained here. So we have been trying to keep up with not only their demands, but their capacity and also the threats they're facing in the field. Yeah, and that raises questions too. I mean, the American people polling shows want to help the Ukrainians. They are inspired by their courage. And I think, frankly, Putin and many others are surprised they've lasted this long and been such a formidable foe. But in feeding so much of our military equipment to Ukraine, there are real concerns. I mean, we've got years overdue orders to Taiwan where there may be a real issue with China at some point, and yet the weaponry we need to provide Taiwan and that they've paid for has not gotten there as we deplete supplies in Ukraine and elsewhere. So what are your concerns on that front? Well, I think the operations in the Ukraine has demonstrated that uh, our industrial base is uh, very strained. It was complicated, of course, by the pandemic, uh, by a shortage of parts, particularly microchips, and we took action uh, to pass the chips bill. Uh, but our whole uh, military industrial base, our munitions factories, et cetera, uh, were, frankly, over many decades, left sort of, uh, I won't say dormant, but not as resilient as they have to be. So 
we're starting through the defense bill and also through the administration's proposals to uh, encourage defense spending and provide the resources we need to cope with uh, not only the threat in the Ukraine, but also a potential threat with China. One of the things that Congress did back in 2017 is we created a fund for the submarine industrial base. So we've been providing resources to rebuild our submarine industrial base since 2017. That was absorbed by the administration and the Department of Defense. But this is a, a, indeed a wake-up call uh, to, to deal with an issue that has not been dealt with for a decade. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to make sure we ask you about the debt ceiling in this respect, too, because you signed on to this letter with Senator Bernie Sanders and others who told the White House you should use the 14th Amendment, go around Congress. You heard what Senator Cruz said. It's just not legally viable. Um, and he's not the only one. I mean, Secretary Yellen, part of this administration, said, you know, it's questionable at best. Why are you supporting something that would go around your authority as a member of Congress? Well, my authority as a member of Congress is to preserve, protect, defend the Constitution of the United States. This is the Constitution of the United States. Uh, this is not just some sort of memo from uh, the White House or from Speaker McCarthy's office. This is a manufactured crisis. For three times, President Trump came to the Congress and asked us to uh, pass a unconditional debt ceiling increase even after he had increased the deficit dramatically by his tax cuts. We did that because we understood the risk of the economy, the risk to the American people, the risk to our national security standing. If we default on our debt, uh, the people in Beijing will be very happy because they will stand up and point out how unreliable we are, how we are reckless, et cetera. This is completely avoidable. All the speaker has to do is what Democrats did. Senator Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, pass a clean debt ceiling and then sit down and negotiate a budget and put everything on the table there. Otherwise, this is reckless, and that's exactly what uh, they're trying to do. And again, the best point uh, to reference is the fact that under President Trump, we understood the dangers of the default. And we acted responsibly and reasonably. In fact, in 2019, Trump said he could not imagine anyone ever using the debt ceiling as leverage in political negotiations. Yeah, and we also remember so, that back in 2006, then Senator uh, Biden said he wouldn't vote for it because it was reckless and irresponsible, the spending that had already been incurred, and it would only encourage it. Um, I want to make sure that we get to this before we go with you. Um, Senator Dianne Feinstein, your colleague, is back on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. A lot of celebrations about that. Um, she admits that her doctor wants her under a lighter workload and seems she has some confusion. Um, and there are questions now um, from Democrats as well about whether she should be there. I want to play something from Congresswoman Katie Porter, who is running to replace Senator Feinstein when she does leave office. Here's what Ms. Porter had to say. This is unfortunately not the first time that we've had the situation where we had a, a real concerns about how senators are um, recovering and whether they're able to come back and really do the job. We just had Senator Fetterman, who was in the yes. hospital for a couple months. What are you going to do when someone becomes yeah. infirm? So, Senator, what do you say to those critics who say it's unfair to have someone in office simply because they would vote your way if they may be struggling with physical or mental issues? Well, I think Senator Feinstein has uh, performed remarkably during her career. I think at this point she has medical issues. She's acknowledged those issues. She still is able to summon the energy and the uh, concentration to come to vote. Uh, she is continuing to work. I think she deserves the opportunity to, to make a decision about her career. I had the opportunity to serve with Strom Thurmond who was uh, 100 years old when he retired. And there were some people back then uh, who were saying he should go, uh, but not with the same kind of uh, intensity today. Uh, again, I think this uh, is something that Senator Feinstein should consider and make a decision. Senator, we appreciate your time. Have a wonderful graduation ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shannon. Up next. We got